whether it is a it is a normal ECG or abnormal ECG, doctor will tell you, give the annotation that this is normal or it is, you know, it is normal but bradycardia, it's arithmetic tachycardia, write those annotations and send it. And now you do not send it, you form a company or even few of you together, you form a group to write a code for complete ECG classification. And it should be a code which is a working code. And do not use the machine learning using only 100 patients. Go to Gangtok hospital, big SMU hospital. That's quite a big hospital, I had visited it once. So you should go and talk to the radio, to the, uh, to the uh, cardiology section talk to the doctors, tell them that we, our, your job will be to send us or to supply us only with ECG data and <coughs> he has to write because today's machines it writes. That is, it is, you know, bradycardia. That means depending upon your, you know, I mean, the, the heart pressure, the blood pressure, it, it's, it, uh, sorry, the pulse beat, it's either less or more, so bradycardia or tachycardia, but then there may be an arrhythmia, the rhythm may be lost in the ECG, that means that there's a heart problem. So do that annotation, take the ECG signals, take the annotation, do the annotation. Can you do it after one year, 2000 patients annotation, not only in ECG, but also go to the pathology section do the annotation. You will learn a lot from them. See, I am a hardcore electronics engineer. How I started learning it when I became the head. Director told me that you have to be the head of uh, School of Medical Science and Technology, where all of our students were doctors. I learned it from them. They were all MBBS doctors coming from all over the country. And then we had engineer students, doctor students, science students, biophysics, biochemistry. So all working together, that becomes a great team. So in medical applications, you will hardly get, you know, this uh, 1000 images. So how to build a deep neural network using small number of samples? This is a research issue. Those who are doing PhDs, you can take this up. How do you design such a deep neural network where you really require a large number of samples? You would not have, you have got a smaller number of samples. So this is, you know, convolution neural network, the CNN, which is the basic of this, you know, this whole issue of neural network. I am not, you know, because time is very short, but in the, today's digital pathology, this whole slide image, this is now a reality. The whole tissue, a big part of the tissue, you biopsy it, you take it out, take the image on the different sections of the tissue at a time, that's all. So the patient goes home and then it comes, becomes the, the problem not only of the doctor but of you also. Because you have to do this, not only the whole slide imaging, but you have to say whether there is any cell which is cancerous cell or not. So this is an interesting thing. Within minutes, it can capture multiple images of the entire tissue. Earlier it was not possible. So there are many such scanners. So today in Philips is there, then Leica biosystems. Anyway, since you do not have any biomedical department here, but then these are very important. So computer-aided de design, I am not going into the whole thing. It will take how much time is left. How much time is left now? I have got here, you know, almost uh, 60 slides. So this is a small thing for the breast FNAC diagnostic system. FNAC means there are two types of samples. One is fine needle aspiration cytology. Usually in breast cancer, we had a big project on this. So the doctors used to take from some part where the, they suspect that there is a malignancy in the breast tumor. 
So they will take, using a very fine needle, they will take aspirate. That means they will take some samples. And then they will put it on the microscope. And on the microscope you get the complete picture of the different cells. So as a computer scientist, you have to see those cells and you have to tell whether the cell is normal or abnormal. So you have to do some image segmentation, you have to do some image processing, etc. And finally you have to say that whether it is a, it is a, like it, lo it looks like this, the psychological images. Now what is the problem? The problem is in A image it is perfectly normal. So all the cells are there, you can see very precisely and there is no problem in any of these cells, they are normal cells. But C, the B, which is known as nucleocytoplasmic cellular features. So this is another such cytoplasm images. But as you can see that in E, E means just the last one. And there you have got lot of problems because many of the cells they are cluttered together. How will you distinguish? How will you differentiate them? So you need a very good algorithm where all the cells are clubbed together. And these cases D and E which are not good. Remember that life is not very easy. The problems which will be coming to you as an expert those are not very easy. Easy things can be automatically taken care of. But many a doctor, many a times the doctors say that I have to review. You take second opinion, third opinion from the doctors. Why? That is because the cases are complex. They are not at all simple. So you as a computer scientist, you are aiding the doctors. So naturally if the doctor is unable to take out the different individual cells which is known as segment these individual cells and present you it to the doctors who will do that you have to do it as a computer scientist or as a video processing scientist so this is this looks like benign in pathological sense we say that okay they are benign but then they are all scattered sheet of pleomorphic nuclei. There are a lot of nuclei who are clubbed together. Scattered sheet, discohesive sheet of pleomorphic nuclei, clumped such pleomorphic nuclei. So these are the nucleuses are all clumped together. So I am not going into the details of that. Now these label items, this is annotation. Take the images from the pathologist, go to the Step one, go to that uh, hospital in Gangtok. Stay there for three days. Talk to the pathologist. Tell them that give us all these images. Okay? And then tell them to do the annotation. That labeling is known as annotation. First image, you will see that, okay, this is isolated nucleus without cytoplasm. Okay? There is a nu nucleus but no cytoplasm. This is a dangerous thing. Every nucleus, if you have got a slight idea about biology, human cells have got a nucleus and on the outer side you have got cytoplasm. There are two parts. Now you are getting only the nucleus and no cytoplasm. This is a dangerous thing. Usually what happens when the nucleus becomes very high, cytoplasm becomes very small, that's a dangerous case. So nucleus area divided by cytoplasm area, this ratio is important. So bigger nucleus, it's not a very good sign for the patient, for the cancer patient. So anyway, there are such abnormally shaped nuclei. Sometimes the nuclei may be straight, spherical, Sometimes you may find that, okay, there are a lot of this thing and discontinuities. Those are all dangerous cases. So you have to find out what they are. Uh, so, so these are, okay, so these are pan-India glimpses of how the 
But let me just go to the other kind of images. This is for oral cancer, especially for boys and uh, those who are taking more of gutka and... Are you, where are you going? Kothai jatcho? Bosho kane? You are not liking? Any question? You, last boy. Do you have any question? Why? If you do not have any question, then I will ask you a question. You can rest assured that you come to the first bench. Come, come here. Then I will ask you a question after the whole thing is over. I will see how much you have... You have to either ask me a question or I will ask you a question. Either of the two, you have to... Yes. Just, just try to understand. I mean, these are not... See, I, I was also like you, a very hardcore electronics engineer, but then I had to learn it when I was almost, you know, more than 45 years of age. So I had to re relearn everything at 50 years almost. So this is, take your, for example, your skin. If you take a small slice of your skin, then what will you see? This is what you are going to see. On the top layer of your skin, this is known as surface epithelium. I have written there, okay? Next is a very important thing. This is known as basement membrane. You can see this is a membrane, small membrane. There are two parts. One is epithelial part that is dark brown, one is the bottom part which is connective tissue. Everybody's skin or oral mucosa or anywhere inside the body, any lining will have this kind of a structure. It's interesting, only there is one, this is known as epithelium, this is known as connective tissue, this bottom one. Okay? And demarketing, this is India-Pakistan border. India-Pakistan border is this. This is known as basement membrane. You can see a small, thin membrane. Now this India-Pakistan border is the major problem. Any border is a major problem. So here also, the cells which reside on this basement membrane, first of all, they go into cancer mode. Cancer starts from here. Now when the cells become cancerous here, then this is an oral mucosa. Oral mucosa means inside the oral, lot of in the oral cavity, lot of people are getting cancer. Do not take all those number ones. Do not smoke. Do not take all these pan parag and um, other things. So do not take any such thing, no pan parag after lunch, absolutely zero. If you have been taking any kind of mouth freshener, simply remove it from today only. Because the number of oral, oral cancers, many cases, people just don't give any importance. And since it's very near to the brain, maybe after 20 years, it affects the brain gradually. Things do not come overnight. Just like the science and technology also does not have any jump, everything is slowly developing, evolution is slow. Similarly, the disease processes are also slowly developing. So what happens is, since you know the cancer cells are, they first grow here, and then if there is any problem with some of the cancerous cells, then they can pierce through the basement membrane. They will just simply from this side, they will come to this side. And then it becomes a problem. Before that, cancer can be treated. So long as they are on the epithelium, this basement membrane, this is the basement membrane, okay? And these cells are known as basal cells. So basal cells, so long as they remain here, there is no problem of cancer. But if they become cancerous, then they will, they will try to 
pierce through the basement membrane and come to this side, from Pakistan side to India or maybe sometimes from India side to Pakistan. So whatever it may be, if there is any transfer, then there is a problem and then it goes through, what are the components here, lot of blood vessels are there. Through blood vessels, these cells, they will move to other parts of the body. And many a times you will hear the term metastasis, that means the cancer has spread it in other parts of the body. And then nothing can be done by the doctors. In how many places they will operate it or they will do the surgery. So this is a major problem of oral mucosa. Now let us see where is the your job. Um, before going to that, a little bit of you know preliminary things I am telling you. So this is a surface. So there are again three regions. This surface keratin layer. This is known as granular layer. Surface keratin means especially you know when somebody becomes old you will see some dead cells all the time the cells are moving from bottom to top and this is a cyclic thing and you may find that some dead cells are there if you just uh, uh, do some you know with soaps and all you will find that a little bit of cells mainly from the feet from parts of the feet from the hands the dead cells may come up so this is an important thing and uh, so, but then these are all, uh, these are not at all harmful, these are all good cells. And uh, so, these are all basal, basal cells. So, there are three types of cells in three different types of stages. One is looking like this, horizontal, and in the, this is known as the middle layer, spinous layer, there the cells automatically become vertical. These nucleus, this part is cyto cytoplasm. Okay, inner part is nucleus. Similarly, here it is nucleus, these are all cytoplasm. Basal cells, they all look like this. Through the microscope you are seeing. Then what you are doing? Digitizing that cell. Next step is you have to transmit that cell to the expert's house. Expert is not sitting here. Here also there is the person who is a pathology expert, who is doing the, who is doing the surgeries, you know, biopsy checking under the microscope, but he is not an expert, he will not do the surgery. So it goes to the surgeon's part. And then from the surgery, now what you have to do? You are taking care of the intermediate layer of doctors who will say that, yes, this has got a oral submucous fibrosis or this is a leukoplakia or this is some kind of cancer, oral cancer. For that, what you need to do is very simple. You need to do the, at the tissue layer, epithelium, basement membrane, connective tissue. As I said, three layers. You have to get the cells separated out. Find its morphology. Morphology means what? How the cell looks like. Texture. Remember that there is a texture everywhere. We can visualize everything, na? On that uh, screen you can see how many types of textures are there. Your, you know, your table has got one type of texture. We use the term texture very often. Mathematically you can find out how the texture features they look like. And there are many other types of features. So all these features together becomes a vector mathematically. Then usually so long we have been using different type of classifiers. And then those classifiers were saying whether it is normal or this was a part of a project where OSF is a disease for pan paragawalas and cigarette smoking and chewing and all those patients. And OSF, if it gets untreated for 10 years, is going to be converted to full-fledged oral cancer. So please, please do not use that. So these are all standard, those who are working on the classifiers, these are all the standard techniques. But then, when we did this project, those days we were not doing much of 
deep learning. Today the most important thing comes here that is you will be using the deep learning methods for this. Madam and sir, those who are from FinTech, I am also giving you a problem to solve and that's a research problem. We are talking about this texture, we are talking about the different features. I do not know anything about finance or business, but I understand that your situations also will have a texture. This will be a very new idea. Somebody from here in research level can collaborate and everything has got a texture. Any visual thing has got a texture. So nobody has thought about the textural patterns or other kinds of features in financial data. So it's a lot of ideas from other areas we borrow and then we found that okay it has got a suppose the textures otherwise we were working from 1980s and then we started applying it to medical images from 1990s afterwards and we found that the normal and the abnormal you know cancerous patients they have got absolutely different textural features. So in biomedical also this was a new thing. Hardly 20 years back we started working with it or 25 years back. In financial sector nobody has done it so far. So we can also chaotic kind of you know financial stuff that can be found out by some kind of such measures which will be very new but anything new that the computer scientists are doing will have some applications in other areas as well. So biomedical applications and finance, fintech, they may not be viewed to a mathematician from different angles. Please try to have that convergence of mind. Remember that many applications in other areas will be of great help to you. Anyway, this is how we do the staining. This is not your job. This will be the pathologists will do and uh, these are the magnifications how a cell looks like. So magnification you can write a small code. Suppose this is only 10x magnification. The same image in 100x magnification looks like this obviously and in uh, you know this 40x magnification. So as you can see that this is also 40x magnification. These are all for different kinds of uh, you know the images. Something is for epithelial thickness. This thickness is one in interesting measure which no doctor in British Medical Journal we are the first to publish it. I was thinking one day that you know human body will always resist the, the onset of cancer, isn't it? Oh, I have got only five minutes more. Yeah, that is good. Okay, so let me go for question answering. Yes. Sorry, I mean, thank you for, uh, if for, um, anyway, so far I am concerned this was just the beginning, but then it's end. But now question and answer, any question that comes to your mind? And as I said, if you do not ask me questions, huh? yeah. Observation. Right. Regarding uh, the theme of the conference today, the theme of the competition, we are really, uh, I am the HOD of AI and DBS department, which is my team. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So we have initiated the department, the computer part, as a layer, top layer, the competition as a bottom layer. Yes. Yeah, please. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Great. Yeah.
No, but then they, from the from behind, they have not asked me a question. Yeah. That's a very, very relevant and very interesting question and observation. Number one is where we are leading to <laughs> and number two is our experience because remember that no algorithm as such only from mathematical point of view will work and it is the experimental experiment experiences of the individuals which will definitely enrich the algorithms further and further, which is very important and which is now one of the major research areas. Well, a lot of, you know, psychiatrists are also involved, not only the neurophysiologists, psychiatrists, computer experts, all together form a team. Okay, so that's very important area. Second important thing is, yes, that CAD GPT, this is a question which we very often you know, come across, and this is the, we are passing through really a very confusing time. One thing let me tell you, that CAD GPT again has not come just like that. Before CAD GPT, similar algorithms, similar software companies were there in USA. Before CAD GPT, they also had released their product, but somehow they could not complete the process of this uh, annotation, they could not complete the process of getting the answer. It's like, you know, your JE, those question answer type of things, but much more than that, because here they can write the codes. Chat GPT will be a real threatening thing to the entire academics world, not to the research world, but surely to the academic world. Now let's see that how we can come across or how we can overcome that. Because after all, you know, science and technology, the way with robotics coming in, with softwares like ChatGPT coming in, with highest form of AI and neural computing coming in, naturally the world is continuously, it will be threatened, threatened by some such kinds of completely, it's a destructive technology. And many professions, for example, tomorrow it may happen that you don't need any lawyer. Every bit of law rules, it can be much, much better explained by a machine. So you don't need any lawyer. You just go and you type down that, okay, what is your case? Don't go to any advocate, so thousands of them they did not have any job but becoming lawyer and trying to get a lot of as many clients and all. Yet shate or jhogla lagi diche and then going to the bar. So it will not be needed. Now let's see that how the, because that is also a, a, a special type of neural network which will be trained using such kinds of input-output relationship. In chat GPT, it can write essays. So how do you write an essay? Can you have here a very small module like chat GPT where in a certain subject, imagine that how much amount of effort has gone about. So in any subject, because in chat GPT, you can give in any problem. 
it solves because I haven't you know tried with everything but a little bit which I had tried I have seen that in many areas it truly gives a good result but then it is not the end it is just the beginning please remember it is just the beginning chat GPT chat GPT has to do a lot more chat GPT still now does not understand how a video works how to analyze how to write an analytics on a video I do not know just show the machine a complete cinema and tell it that you write an essay on it can it do still now no but then if you just see the vision experts they have done it at least 15 years back the complete video analytics have been already developed if you can tell me put one camera outside your house and continuously for 365 days 24 hours a day it should work and uh, can you imagine that a video camera which should work from morning to night every day for 365 days we had developed that software for Intel cameras in 2004-2005 and we worked in Sweden in Chicago in Phoenix and completely for later on it was funded by you will be surprised to know the company which is known as McDonald McDonald was funding us this big project for their drive-ins this is another interesting project drive-in means if you go to an to an to any restaurant because in America or in Europe they go everybody has a car so you drive in then there is a microphone you give the order so this is known as order counter just in the microphone you tell them fish fillet four or if you want to eat anything else um, nugget or anything you can give that order I used to like fish fillet so I used to tell fish fillet go to the next counter by the time you go there reach there that's a pay counter give us ten dollars sir automatically no human being so you just give ten dollars go to the pickup counter by that time the food is ready you take the food go out so now here is a business the business McDonald found was that they are losing millions of dollars all over the world because they have got business in, in America in USA in Europe even in many parts of India those days in India we did not have any McDonald but later on I found in many Indian cities now McDonald is there now how was it possible how, what was the problem the problem was during the evening time there used to be a lot of queues because Americans they take their dinner at 5 o'clock 6 o'clock around that time that's their dinner time there will be a lot of while going out of the office they were taking picking up the dinner from McDonald especially the poor people because McDonald is not for rich people although uh, you like as, as a youngster I also used to like those <laughs> McDonald fillets and all but very bad for health uh, but anyway so you go there and pick up the food and then go back home now they found that there's a huge queue and many people they will drive off drive off means that terminal every terminology has got a meaning drive off means that they will not take they will not so they will be going through another route going out to another shop so they had a an estimation that millions of dollars every day they are losing so this is a problem of business so they said that okay if we can have a video camera there then can we do it so we said yes it can be done it's a simple problem but what is the problem problem is not only that evening time evening time there is no sunlight okay whole night is is dark imagine that a McDonald which is working in a particular area where there is not not that every part of America or Europe is lighted in many stretches there is no light so there is a McDonald restaurant there 
how does the camera work if there is no light so you have to model the background imagine again in your case in finance case i do not understand anything of finance or business but this background modeling is a major problem please remember you are listening today maybe after 20 years you will come across a problem where everywhere background modeling will be needed what is background modeling here it is modeling the environmental light just about an hour back at three o'clock or at four o'clock there was full sunshine suddenly the sunshine becomes less and less and less suddenly it becomes dark so how does the computer know how does the video camera know how can it still see so your computer algorithm will have to model this background automatically as the sunshine as the light is dimming and dimming so that even at night no light but your camera must be working is you cannot say to the client to the mcdonald company no no my camera will only work in the otherwise if you you say thermal camera cost will be gigantic very high even if you have got ir camera those days it was very highly costly so our cameras were supplied by a swedish company so they used to give us lot of very interesting projects there's a big hall bigger than this fully lighted okay so somebody is moving through that you have to track that person somebody is going there 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 and suddenly they will put off all the lights it becomes in a fraction of a second completely dark you have to still track that person in that room where that person is going interesting no and you cannot tell that no no in darkness my camera does not work there comes this machine learning so machine must continuously learn so that for any circumstances you should be able to correctly visualize track and understand now for finance people since fintech is there i am repeatedly talking about something we about which i know nothing but to me it appears that there are a lot of background noises you know all on a sudden if you find that what is his name that man who has cheated adani everybody knew that he is having a big business and all on a sudden <laughs> you find that okay it's all half his share values have dropped down even the previous night none of the fintech companies could know what adani was doing so this kind of a it's a short noise in electrical science terminology short like a shot it comes adani is every newspaper headline yesterday headline was adani is third financially and today after 48 hours after that hindenburg report adani became 68 a poor businessman how could it so this is a noise no so this is a noise that comes in so how do you take care of such kinds of noise how did it happen similarly here also all on a sudden there is no light still your machine learning all that i am saying is machine learning is a very very powerful tool it should be able to correctly track that human being properly and there are algorithms for that and the basic thing is always remember one thing now whatever analytics you are trying to do there is a background to that and that background often is noisy background and that noise has to be understood not the signal signal is as important as the noise so to differentiate between the two is again another challenge so far as the research is concerned anyway i think i have taken much more time than was allotted to me so thank you very much but uh, one thing if you do not ask me a question immediately 
I will ask you to the students. That is what I have always practiced in my class in IIT. Students, they knew that if you do not ask me a question, then I will ask you a question. Kyo lo? Just get up and ask, you do not. Good. My question to you is, uh, like, so creating a model, so the data processing is very important, right, sir? Hmm? Data pre-processing, sir. Very important, right. So, and like, in terms of data pre-processing, sir, what kind of features we extract from that data? So, like, uh, in terms of feature extraction, there will be many, many methods, sir, like, in signal processing, sir, SDFT, the MFCCs. So, what would you consider of, like, what should we take into account by selecting what very, very brilliant questions. So in the earlier days, you know, I mean, there were two phases. One is data pre-processing. You are very right. Pre-processing does not involve many times the feature extraction. Extracting the feature comes, used to come as the second layer. But pre-processing was removing the noise from the data. Many times there are a lot of noise. For example, the social media news is a Many times it's a fake news. So how will you find out that is a fake news and this is a correct news? So that's a pre-processing. There are a lot of techniques for noise removal. But most importantly, you are talking about that what are the kind of features and how will you select the features? That's a good question. There are many such, as you very rightly find, uh, pointed out, for example, the co-occurrence matrix-based feature. For example, the texture-based feature, morphological-based feature. Hundreds of different techniques are there for the feature extraction. But the beautiful part of this deep learning is that you don't need to extract any feature yourself by any algorithm. Using convolution neural network, deep learning, having large number of layers, maybe that 200 layers, 300 layers, 400 layers, the whole function, the complex function will automatically be mapped by this multi-layered CNN network, deep learning. And by so many layers, it can be, it can be mathematically proved that it can model any complex function, that is any complex you know, situation very correctly. Features will be extracted automatically by the deep neural network. You don't need to either extract the features. In the earlier days, we used to extract the features, and then not all the features will be equally useful. Many of the features are redundant features. For example, in face recognition, one of my students, Puneet Chadda, in his final year project, so he said, I said, okay, how many features will be there? He is now the CEO of a big company. So he talks to me quite often. I know everybody's project. Every year on the average, there would have been 10 to 12 BTEC students with me. And um, I, I still remember all their projects, what he did. I'll just tell you only uh, one thing. That is, you have to select. For example, one of the features is in face recognition, just your eyebrow, middle of the eyebrow, and find the distance from the middle of the eyebrows. Now there are a lot of problems. Somebody says that the, that, that the black portion of the eye and the distance between them and the distance between the mid portion of the eyebrows, they are dependent on each other. Remember that if you, if you extract 30 features, there will be at least 10 features which are dependent on other features. Many people, while doing their projects or even in companies I have seen, that they do not take care of the consideration that the dependent features are absolutely not useful. You have to remove them. Otherwise, how many features you will use? 100, 200? This is known as the problem of dimensionality reduction. You have to reduce the dimensionality. Only the best features should be kept. And that best features are kept using deep neural networks. 
Okay, so that is a very, very good question. Maybe that in detail I could go, but then even a small thing will take hours together to explain in detail. But very good, good question. So on your, and another student had asked something quickly. I think that. Uh, I haven't even started. So that's a, another very good question. Unfortunately, I had to talk more about the preliminaries and all. Already taken more than one hour. But yes, there are a lot of newer techniques for cancer detection. For example, one of the imaging techniques is SPECT currently. SPECT is, it's, you know, I mean, some kind of uh, uh, you know, the detection by a special kind of sensor, PET and SPECT. So these are the two techniques which are absolutely used. You will find that PET CT scanner, this term is very common. If you go to any of these cancer research, cancer hospitals, like say if you go to Tata, Tata Medical Center, they will say that, okay, let me show the PET city, uh, you know, the images. Sometime back during the COVID time, I had given a full-fledged lecture for two hours on PET and SPECT. But if you are interested, we can, <laughs> it's a huge and very interesting area. So that is, so far as today's world is concerned, one of the new things. But again, science and technology is moving like anything. Now from PET and CT scanning, these two modality informations need to be fused together. What the point? So one part of the research is how to do that data fusion and inference fusion. You are getting two different results from two modalities. How to fuse them? to come to the final conclusion which will ensure zero error or minimize the error sufficiently enough. Very good question. So both the questions are excellent. Uh, I'm again sorry, other speakers must be angry with me. So <laughs> once again, a very, very best wishes from my side to all of you. And I wish very well of each one of you the teachers, the students, the administrators, the directors, for a very bright, happy, and glorious day ahead. Thank you. So that was an exciting and insightful session and on the behalf of audience I extend the gratitude to you for sharing the knowledge on digital pathology, requirement of deep learning techniques and the growing demand of annotation. Now may I request respected director SMIT and patron ICAP 2023 Professor Dr. GL Sharma sir to kindly offer our token of respect and appreciation to Professor Dr. Ajay Kumar Roy. Thank you sir. The audience may now leave for lunch. Volunteers are requested to escort the dignitaries and guests. I request everyone to be seated at MPH Hall in the F Block by 2.15 p.m. 
for the industrial talk by Namura Research Institute. Thank you. There also will be a parallel session in seminar hall by Professor Dr. Tapan Gandhi. Thank you.
कोई जा रहा है भाई हेलो 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 एक घंटा नहीं बट मैं तो करता हूं बाकी पूरी जल्दी
हेलो हेलो वन टू वन टू वन टू वन टू चेक चेक Good afternoon and welcome back everyone. I'd like to remind you to put your cell phones on silent mode. I repeat, I request everyone to put their cell phones on silent mode. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests and honored dignitaries, I, Pema Yongzom Doji, take the pleasure to introduce our esteemed speakers for invited industry talk by our industry partner representatives, Ms. Sangeeta Das and Mr. Aditya Keal. Mr. Aditya Kyal, a senior technical project manager at Nomura Research Institute Financial Technologies. India Private Limited, with diverse experience in the field of recruitment, performance appraisal, benefits, 
training and development, rewards and recognitions, and competency mapping. She has developed and implemented HR strategies in alliance with business strategy. Few of her key contributions have been in the field of employee relations, positive working environment, and fostering employee-friendly HR policies. I would like to request the representatives from NRI FinTech to please come onto the stage. to SMIT for organizing such a big uh, prestigious tech events and inviting us to join this event. Thank you once again. Uh, will not take much of your time. Uh, well, let me introduce myself as Sangeeta Das. They have already introduced. So once again, I'm talking about myself. So I have been here in this organization more than uh, 18 years in NRI FinTech. So uh, power count. I mean, uh, parent company is NRI, I'm coming to that. So today I'll be talking about our organization in a brief. After that, Mr. Aditya Kayal, who is a technical person, he will cover the most interesting part of this PPT. He'll talk about the technology, our products, and uh, definitely there will be a question answer session. So let me talk about my organization. Research Institute, Financial Technologies, India Private Limited, but a big name we used to call it as NRI FinTech. So NRI FinTech is a part of leading Japanese firm, Nomura Research Institute. So let me talk about our parent organization which has started its journey in the year 1965. Okay. And uh, over the last 50 years of experience in systems and strategies, they are providing consulting services. They have become the leading consulting and technology solutions firm in Japan. So as I've already told you that we have started our journey in the year 1965. In the year 1966, there is an establishment of Nomura Computing Center. And in the year 1988, there is a merger took place of Nomura Research Institute and Nomura Computer System. In the year 2001, we and I listed on the first section of Tokyo Stock Exchange. So the journey starts from here for providing fintech solutions to the stock market. 2015, we have completed our 50th anniversary. 2021, completed our 20th anniversary of our listing into the stock exchange in Japan. Nomura Research Institute, uh, they have expanded and throughout the country, throughout the world, 16 countries, they have set their footprints, and 83 subsidiaries, they have already established their activities. Uh, till last fiscal year, we have, uh, on, we have gone through a sales of total 611.6 billion yen, and we have achieved a profit of 106.2 billion yen. We have recruited so far globally more than 16,000 employees. So here you can see the, our business segment of Nomura Research Institute. They are providing services in financial IT solutions, IT platform services, consulting, as well as industrial IT solutions. So major segment is financial IT solutions. We are providing these IT solutions to the major financial institutions like securities, insurance, banking, asset management, and other financial sectors. This is the major core segment of Nomura Research Institute.
so throughout their journey, uh, as of Intech Solution Provider, we have been awarded by defined institutes like FTF News Technology Innovation Awards, consecutive years from 2016 till 2022, we have achieved awards for providing this FinTech solutions. And IDC Financial Insights, an American banker, also we have been awarded, and we have ranked in the top 10 for the last 11 consecutive years. So I'm moving to the next slide. So now I'll be talking about NRI FinTech, which is a part of Nomura Research Institute. In NRI FinTech, we have a mission to globally support this capital market and give, provide the end-to-end -end solution to the client and technology expertise and quality services to the client. And while providing the services, we have some capabilities. We have uh, developed our center of excellence on blockchain and information security as well as on remote infrastructure management services. Also, we have the capability in multiple phases, mission critical information, implementation capability throughout globally distributed offices. We have rich comprehensive experience in transition management. We have cross-functional resource pool, like coming people are coming from technology expertise, domain expertise, quality service provider. And we have been certified in CMMI and ISO 27001 so far. In NRI FinTech, we follow the total software development life cycle, starting from designing, development, delivery, maintenance to support. So while providing this end-to-end -end solution to the client, we use our expertise, uh, starting from business development, sales, business analysis, research and development, then development and quality assurance, software implementation, and finally providing global support to the client. So far we have recruited more than 400 people. So having a diversified skill set, most of them are technically expert. And uh, we also recruit from the domain specialist. Uh, mainly they are coming from the stock exchange market who are involved in the security brokers, asset managers, try to attract them from the market. And they are mainly uh, involved with us for the business analysis, starting from business analysis, development, and up to the delivery and maintenance. Also, we have the implementation expertise in different countries. Japan, Australia, USA, UK, and also we have set our footprints in some emerging markets like Thailand, Sri Lanka, and Mongolia. We do believe in quality assurance service to our clients. While providing the service to the client, we definitely follow our project framework and the guidelines set by our Tokyo, NRI Tokyo, Japan. I'd request Aditya to take over from here. He will talk about our technology, our domain, and different functionalities. Thank you all. Um, thank you, Ms. Sangeeta. So now that we've established the pedigree of NRI FinTech, and what really qualifies us to be standing here and talking to you about what a FinTech industry really wants, Let's see from a technical standpoint, what is it that we really do and how are we utilizing it to solve real world businesses? So the core NRI FinTech expertise lies in the technical domain of technology implementation for enterprise. A lot of big words, so let me really break it down. Uh, for us as students, primarily all technology revolves around learning a new programming language every semester. At NRI FinTech India, it was no different. We use all of the languages and many more that you would have learned. But we adapt them for enterprises, using them in enterprise settings. So you'll find a lot of the technology that you've heard of, a lot of technology that you've read, or maybe you're going to learn in the future coming time in your school and academia, being used in NRI FinTech. Stuff like Java, Python, Node.js, um, a lot of enterprise service bus, a lot of different data stores, 
cloud services, Daml, which is a blockchain specialized for block for fintech. All of it is being used somewhere or the other, and we have experts in all of these kind of technology stacks. This technology by itself is not is not going to solve real world business problems, right? So that is where the domain expertise comes into play. From a domain expertise perspective, NRI FinTech has exceptional expertise in the post-execution life cycle of security trades. What is exactly this? I'll not go into delve into much details of it, but security trading is nothing but uh, the trading that we know in the share market or in stock markets. For an end user, you play a you place a buy order, you place a sell order, and your job is done. And that is where we come in. Once your buy order or your sell order has got executed in the market, everything that happens behind the scenes, things that you're not aware of, we will take it over. And starting with coordinating with the depositories, custodians, traders, clearing corporations, and in different institutions, we'll ensure that your trades are successfully completed in time. That is one of our strongest domain expertise and this is something that we've actually deployed in multiple countries and multiple continents. How do we do this? How do we provide these kind of services? So to provide these services, we generally have two types of offerings. These offerings are divided into solutions and services. So what is a solution? So at NRI FinTech, we have pre-built products targeting different segments of the security post-trade lifecycle. So our star product or the most popular product that we have is the iStar GV suit, which is targeted for brokers. This application has actually been deployed across more than three to four continents and with more than seven to eight different countries or different stock exchanges and different brokers within these stock exchanges. Then we have iStar CS, which is our solution for custodians and then T-Star GV, which is our solution for asset managers. While the products by itself do solve a very specific business problem, not everyone is looking for just the product out of the box because every business, every business operates with a slight flavor of their own life cycle. So that is where we have a complete services wing which helps customize these products and at times even enrich develop new products for different business needs. So that in the services wing, we deal with enterprise service development. We deal with domain consulting. We have a huge consulting experience with people coming from directly custodians, stock exchanges, asset management firms. We have implementation and maintenance activities. We have cloud advisory and management services, and we have testing services. All of this is great. <clears throat> Sorry, but what really differentiates us is the extra cherry on top. And that comes in the form of our center of excellence. So at NRI FinTech, we are having three center of excellence targeting cutting edge solutions for the industry. The first center of excellence that I would be talking about right now is information security. In the last four to five years, security has become a pain point for literally every enterprise. And as a matter of fact, for individuals as well. So every other day you're going to read in the newspapers that there was a ransomware attack, there was a phishing attack, someone lost this sum of money, there was a data leak from some organization. These kind of pro this proliferation of attacks has become extensively common in the workplace nowadays. And this has resulted in serious financial loss for organizations. That is where the information security services provided by NRI FinTech comes into play. We provide WAPT or basically vulnerability assessment. So we employ white hat hackers, ethical hackers, who actually will penetrate your systems, find vulnerabilities, weaknesses in your system, and tell you that you need to improve on this front because you're vulnerable. We help you perform periodic vulnerability management. So no system once hardened, I mean, you know, every new, uh, every single day, a new vulnerability or a new weakness is being discovered by hackers. Hackers are not sleeping at night, neither can you which is where the periodic maintenance activities provided by the ISS comes into play. And we also do a lot of consulting and risk management uh, consulting in this area. Additionally, that's mostly from the infrastructure side, if I can say so. We also do the same thing on the application side. So on the application side, 
We do penetration testing of applications. We do white box as well as black box testing. We do sec security risk remediation. We'll provide you solutions to your problems. And we are going to do a lot of security policy and consulting. So this center of excellence that we have at NIF Fintech really focuses on helping enterprises avoid getting into the trap of a hacker. We help them secure their systems, secure their hardware, secure their infrastructure as a whole so that they do not lose face in the industry, they do not lose faith in their customers. The next center of excellence is more or less uh, has really gained popularity thanks to pandemic. So March 2020 was a very interesting time for a lot of people in the world. Overnight people realized that they are not going to office. Companies that had a huge IT workforce, they had huge system admins, network admins, all of them would come. You had a problem in your laptop, you go to them and they're going to look at your laptop and fix it. All of that went poof. You couldn't do that anymore. Why? Because everybody was working remotely. So now how do you solve this infrastructure problem? Hence comes in RIMS or the Remote Infrastructure Management. As the name suggests quite simply, RIMS allows people to remotely manage your entire infrastructure. NRI FinTech also has a center of excellence in RIMS. This is kind of a value add along with the ISS or the security services where we help you maintain, manage your infrastructure, whether it's routers, it's network, it's switch, or it's your desktops, laptops, cloud environments. Everywhere we would be helping you cover all of your basic needs of maintaining a network. And the last center of excellence, probably the one that's closest to my heart, is our center of excellence on blockchain. So blockchain has kind of taken the world by storm in the last 15 years. Um, Think blockchain, think cryptocurrency. Think cryptocurrency, think money, right? People are really interested in blockchain in the last 15 years. And enterprises have also taken to blockchain as a concept in the last five to seven years. So NRI FinTech is not someone who's sleeping. NRI FinTech also realizes the importance and the challenges that blockchain brings to business. So what we've done is we've, we help organizations upgrade their existing businesses to support blockchain. We help launch and we are actually already in the process of launching new products in the cryptocurrency domain. Now here we do not mean that we are working for cryptocurrencies, we are not launching new cryptocurrencies, but there are multiple cryptocurrencies and when enterprises enter the cryptocurrency domain which is so less regulated, they need to have a stable partner so as to help them navigate that domain. Give them the right solutions so that they can adapt it to the enterprise needs. And that is why NRI FinTech's center of excellence for the blockchain comes into play. And we are also doing a lot of consulting in identifying new focus areas for the blockchain. So using this as a perfect segue for my next segment, I'm going to try and discuss some practical applications of blockchain in capital markets. So what am I really going to try and cover in this section of our talk? So very briefly, first we are going to go through a very simplistic view of what is blockchain. What is a blockchain? Why do I need a blockchain? And where do I use a blockchain? Next, we are going to target or understand a very specific case of use, specific use case of blockchain that has been identified by the New York Stock Exchange, which is controlling short squeeze in the New York Stock Exchange. So this is a very interesting problem that was identified and how we are using blockchain to solve it is makes it just a lot more interesting. So what is blockchain? Blockchain, although we think blockchain is a very new concept, right? But the genesis of the idea of blockchain is as old as 1982. So it's not that blockchain was only discovered as a concept in 2008-2009, no. It was originally, the idea of the first blockchain was published in 1982, but it has its own weaknesses, it has its own fallacies. And the biggest challenge with blockchain was in 1982, was that we didn't have the required computing power. Blockchain requires a lot of computing power. 
it was only when moore's law really brought the computing power to a state where it became so cheap that today's mobile phone has more computing power than what we could dream of in 1980s and 1990s it's only today that we've been able to realize blockchain in the way it is today and to be very specific the way we actually understand blockchain today it was proposed by a developer known as satoshi nakamoto in his 2008 paper of block of bitcoins so in 2008 satoshi nakamoto published a paper where he proposed that there should be a decentralized digital currency called bitcoin he came up with the whole concept of blockchain as a digital ledger that would be used to maintain all information pertaining to bitcoins and in that paper he also floated the idea that because it is decentralized it has to be a distributed digital ledger the fun part is today whenever we read about blockchain you're going to see that the blockchain always appears as a single word even in my ppt all across you're going to see that blockchain has actually been written as a single word but in the original paper that was published in 2008 the etymology of blockchain was actually divided into two words so he had all described the word itself as block and chain so what was a block the block is simply a digital record of information and the chain part of it came in that you would link multiple blocks so as to form it into a chain sounds very similar you know the first thing that comes to my mind when i hear this link list right you have a node another node a third node all of them are linked together so what made blockchain different from link list what made blockchain a disruptive technology link list has existed since ages right so what made blockchain different the things that made blockchain different is first and foremost transparency immutability security consensus and smart contracts nice words but what do they mean to you and me what do they mean to the enterprise right so we have a lot of research papers we can read all of it it all sounds great but how would i apply this to an enterprise how do these five things make blockchain a disruptive tech for enterprises to understand that let's first understand how an existing system in the real world works and for that i'm going to go back to the most simple thing that we all know e-commerce each and every one of us day in and day out are on our phones trying to buy something from amazon from flipkart from snapdeal or some of the other e-commerce site so in a very simplistic view of a e-commerce site how does any operations work you have a customer the customer logs on to their preferred e-commerce portal and they place a order 3 days 5 days later you get back your products and you are very happy but behind the scenes a lot of movement is going on a lot of things are happening what's happening in a very simplistic world first step the e-commerce portal informs the seller that hey there is an order for you the seller checks his inventory informs the warehouse that okay we need to pack this particular item in the in parallel informs the delivery company that okay i have a shipment for you please go and pick it up from my warehouse the delivery company goes to the warehouse picks up that item brings it back and ships it to the customer and this entire process in a normal operations will take anything from 2 days to 10 days which means for 10 days a customer is waiting every day that okay i'll hopefully get my product today or tomorrow or day after yes they have algorithms that predict a particular date but wouldn't it be great for you and me if i got the product today itself or tomorrow itself why is amazon's one day shipping a rarity and not a definitiveness it's not something that's guaranteed right so what are the challenges in this whole process the first and foremost challenge is sequential flow of data so what is sequential flow of data once the customer places an order with the e-commerce the first step that the e-commerce takes is the e-commerce informs the seller 
At that point of time, my delivery company and my warehouse have absolutely no clue about what's happening. Let's say the guy who's responsible for informing the delivery company and warehouse is on leave for two days. You're not gonna get. You're not gonna get your shipment for two more days. There's a holiday in between. It's a weekend. You're not gonna get it, right? It's only when the seller informs the warehouse and the delivery company that the thing moves forward. Now the delivery company knows that there's a shipment to be picked up, but the delivery company doesn't know what is the size of the shipment, what is the weight of the shipment, what type of packaging it has gone under. All of that information it practically gets to know only when it reaches the warehouse. Once it reaches the warehouse, it picks up the shipment, takes it back to its hub. There it scans the shipment, analyzes whether I can fit it in into truck A or truck B. Then it will evaluate if that truck is gonna go via the long route or the short route, and that is how the entire operation gets delayed. <clears throat> this presents another problem. What is that problem? The second problem is after my sequential flow of data is slowing things down. Each of these are independent entities or independent firms, right? So obviously you know your e-commerce is something like an Amazon. If I take an example, the seller could be any seller on that platform. The warehouse could be operated by a third party. That third party could be Amazon. It could be somebody else. The delivery company again could be absolutely any delivery company. It could be Blue Dart. It could be DTDC. It could be any other delivery company of their choosing. And each of these delivery companies maintain their own ledger, which fundamentally means. I maintain my own record of information, and the other company also maintains their own record of information. At a certain interval, it could be monthly, it could be weekly. When I'm going to bill my counterparty, at that point of time, I'm going to prepare a report and send it to my counterparty. Counterparty is going to check that okay, everything that you say is right or wrong against their own digital ledger, and this checking is known as reconciliation. Reconciliation is one of the biggest problem that enterprises face because this leads to the maximum number of breaks or disagreements. So I thought my delivery company says I shipped ten items for you. In my records, it just shows eight. So we get into an argument that no, no, it's not ten, it's eight. No, no, I didn't send. To, you've got two extra. And then both of us will go down a rabbit hole trying to identify where did those two come from. Sometimes it's resolved amicably. Sometimes those disagreements take much longer time to resolve. In the meantime, my operations might be running, but a lot of payment, money, everything is stuck in the pipeline. And sometimes it takes an ugly turn. When it takes an ugly turn, you get into lawsuits. Nobody likes lawsuits. Neither firms like them, neither people like them. So, what would be a good solution for this business problem? Enter blockchain. So how does blockchain help? <coughs> blockchain is a distributed ledger, and the beauty of blockchain is it's a shared distributed ledger. Emphasis on the word shared. What that would mean is earlier each of these companies were maintaining their own separate ledgers. Now what is going to happen is each of these companies are going to maintain their ledger on the shared blockchain. Because it is distributed, each one has the same data copied across each of these nodes, but with controls. So the internal data corresponding to the e-commerce is not visible to the delivery and vice versa. So those kind of controls can be built in into the blockchain, but the data is being copied, and where the relevant data, where the concerned entities need to be informed, they will know about it. So why is this an advantage? Because now, when my customer places an order with the e-commerce firm, the e-commerce firm logs it into the blockchain, and immediately all of that information is known to the seller, it's known to the warehouse, it's known to the delivery company. So each one of them, basically, the delivery company and the warehouse have got a heads up. The delivery company knows that okay, it is a washing machine which has been ordered and not a book. It is gonna weigh X kgs or Y kgs. What would be the dimensions of my packaged product? The warehouse can go ahead and package it, pre-package it. The warehouse knows if it's somewhere right in the back and it needs to do a lot of movement, moving around to get that product. They can go ahead and do it before time. 
this shared view increases the transparency and also because each one of the concerned members are on the same blockchain the advantage is that there are no more disagreements because each of them have the exact same record it in a blockchain it can never happen that an order which was placed in the e-commerce firm can appear as 10 in the warehouse and 12 at the delivery company which can happen when you're actually dealing with different ledgers so the same network allows us greater transparency each one is on the same page real-time notification status reporting and better planning and execution but I could have achieved the same thing by just simply having a shared RDBMS shared across all these four participants so why don't I do that what's why blockchain right so nothing stopped me from just having one simple relational database put on the cloud and giving that access with controls to each of these individual participants that is where the security aspects of blockchain come in so blockchain other some of the important factors of blockchain one thing very important immutability so what is immutability what does immutable mean immutable is something that cannot be modified so let's consider the scenario in our blockchain in my warehouse there is a rogue, rogue operator now my warehouse wants to change the data because they want to make money so they decide that okay you place 10 orders let me go ahead and update that order from a small order to a big order that way I'll be able to charge you more but my operations are immutable so if an order was placed my warehouse rogue operator cannot actually update the order that is the beauty guaranteed by the blockchain how does it guarantee this it guarantees this through cryptography so what how is this cryptography helping us achieve immutability a very simplistic representation of it okay so there are these blocks of data all of them are interconnected each block contains the previous nodes hash and it has a message signature additionally it could have a nonce and other security features but for simplicity I'm eliminating that factor so I have a previous node hash in the very genesis block there will be no previous node hash because that's the genesis block or the first block but all subsequent blocks in my chain are going to have the previous node hash a data you calculate a message signature run it through a cryptographic function and come up with a node hash this node hash gets copied to my next node and so on and so forth now my operator comes decides to change the data because he likes to he fits in a new data the minute you modified this data my message signature changes the output of my cryptographic function changes and all the nodes that were beneath this modified data are rendered nullified because they don't have a valid chain anymore this is how you are guaranteeing that no data can be changed or modified without having an impact and notifying all concerned participants but my rogue operator is very smart right we, you all know you know this is a fact right for every security place you will have a guy trying to break it for every rule there's a break off so what he wants to do is he thinks okay fine you don't want me to let you don't want me to change one node so I'm gonna change the entire chain I modify this particular node I modified the next node and I modify all subsequent nodes then there is no way for me to know that actually there has been tampering of data so the original chain that we had was a b c d e f g my rogue operator he wants to change the data he goes ahead and changes it to a b c d x y z now what is happening is he is not the only operator on the chain there are multiple entities with copies of the same data so when he tries to publish the new chain to the blockchain the network automatically there is going to be a consensus coming into play 
in a very simplistic view you can think of consensus as the majority view so my rogue operator says it's xyz the last three uh, blocks in my chain but my other three elements say that hey it's efg so immediately his change is rejected by the network or in other words the change that was being proposed or tried to be applied by the rogue operator at the warehouse is rejected by the blockchain hence ensuring the sanctity of my chain or sanctity of my data while there are multiple different ways of achieving consensus uh, there's a proof of work which was popularized by bitcoin there's proof of stake so proof of stake has become really popular now because um, ethereum network which is one of the largest blockchain networks in the world used to run on the proof of work uh, last year sometime at october or november they had something known as the great merge and that merge is when they actually move from the proof of work to the proof of stake model of consensus why did they do that because by moving from the proof of work model to the proof of stake model they were actually able to reduce their carbon footprint or the amount of energy that was being used by almost 95% it is said that by doing this particular chain change from proof of work to proof of stake they've saved enough energy to actually power a continent and then you've got other different algorithms such as proof of history or elapsed time which is quite popular with solana yet another operator so this is one definitely now we are able to cover security aspects we are able to cover the immutability aspects we are also able to cover your transparency but what really really inspires enterprises is automation we love automation and we love it why because it helps us save costs right any enterprise is only after one and one thing roi or return on investment they want to save money and smart contracts are the way to go when they want to save money so what is this smart contract theoretically a smart contract is nothing but a simple program that is stored on the blockchain and it is run when a condition is met so let's kind of understand it with an example in my delivery company we have two modes of delivery it can either be land based or air based so the delivery company goes into an agreement with the seller a very simplistic agreement that if the weight of your shipped product is less than 1 kg ship it by airplane if it is greater than 1 kg you're going to ship it by road now this will again bring in a certain amount of discrepancy because it could happen that if left to the choice of my delivery company they might say that yeah i know your weight was less than 900 but i decided to ship it by air so you give me the air freight again get into arguments again get into disagreements the same old problem has cropped back hence enter a smart contract so what you can do is you can simply have a smart contract written on your blockchain network where the contract would be written in a language that's understood by your network so generally the most popular network for fintech domain is provided by digital assets and the smart contract that they write it in is called daml but on the ethereum network solidity is the uh, language of choice for smart contracts so very simply your contract could be something like if the weight is less than 1 kg then choose airplane mode of transport else you choose a truck or the land mode so these kind of smart contracts will help avoid disagreements because once again through automated mode the choice of delivery has been decided neither the delivery company had a say in it neither the seller had a say in it the network has decided based on some pre agreed agreements between the two participants and has been enforced and written down in the blockchain through a smart contract and that is what really inspires enterprises greater automation things are happening automatically i don't need a guy to sit in the seller's office and decide a or b it's coded on the blockchain so everybody is able to see it everybody knows what it's doing it's self verifying and it's self enforcing so you don't need an individual now to actually go ahead and make any changes and these aspects of the blockchain have made it the disruptive technology on the for enterprises definitely blockchain presents a lot of advantages to a lot of different players like cryptocurrencies but what really inspires the enterprise are these five features of the blockchain 
So where is this blockchain then being used? So what are the common use cases of blockchain in the real world? First and foremost, the no-brainer part of it, cryptocurrencies. The problem is, for majority of us, we are using cryptocurrencies and blockchain interchangeably. You know, if I'm working on blockchain, means I'm working on cryptocurrencies. If I'm working on cryptocurrency, I'm working on blockchain. That's a myth. That's an absolute incorrect assumption. Blockchain, yes, blockchain was conceptualized during the creation of the Bitcoin cryptocurrency in the current format as we know it. But blockchain is a complete separate technology as we've kind of illustrated. And that is why today it is being used for a lot of different use cases in the real world. Starting with NFTs or non-fungible tokens. So a lot of these NFTs are today being the providence of your provenance of, you know, your NFTs are being recorded on the blockchain, on the distributed Ethereum blockchain. Provenance is nothing but the record of ownership of tokens. Another very, very interesting use case was in the last two years. This came in with COVID. So governments all over the world and also government of India was facing a very critical issue. What was this issue? There were hundreds of you know, testing centers for COVID all across the country. Each one of them were doing their own tests. They were published, giving the test report to individuals. You've been given a test report. How does the government itself, how does the municipal corporation, how do the police get to know about it? Because if they don't get to know about it, how are they going to quarantine your house? How are they going to provide you with the required supplies that you need? How will they ensure and keep a tab on you that if you need any medical emergency, you can be provided in time? Given this business problem, a very interesting experiment was done. The entire issuance of digital certificates for COVID test results was moved to the blockchain. And all different participants concerned entities, from starting from the test centers to the municipal corporations to the police departments, all of them were also loaded onto this blockchain. The advantages that we got was transparency and security. So there was no way that I could fudge my results. If I tested COVID positive, there was no way that I could change it to negative unless I have rerun the test. And similarly, every concerned entity or every concerned authority member of the government machinery would be informed whenever someone is, in, is positive. The next common use case that we've seen in the government circles is issuance of death certificates and land records. So this is again a very common use case that we are now seeing from the government that they are maintaining these kind of things that require high guarantee on the ledger or on the blockchain. On the corporate side, issuance of green bonds. So green bonds are basically when a company wants to issue new bonds to raise money from banks and other entities, they issue bonds. If anyone has taken a loan, whether it's a car loan, whether it's a bike loan or it's a house loan, you know what a cumbersome process, legally speaking, it is to take a loan. And there are many companies that get into some pre-agreed criteria with banks, multiple banks as a matter of fact, and they continuously have to raise short term as well as long term loans. And every time they raise this loan, they need to go back to the bank or do a lot of legal paperwork before they execute this. That is something where the blockchain has really helped reduce the costs for these companies. Because they are on a blockchain, using a smart contract, they can all come to a pre-agreed legal agreement. Now, whenever someone wants to raise a loan, they simply go, raise a request on the chain. There are certain rules already embedded into the blockchain the, with, to which the banks have agreed. And that automatically results in the loan going to the right bank. Or once a bank says, OK, I'm ready to give it, all the subsequent down steps are done and everything happens automatically. There is no need to have any legal person involved per se, except for the very first time. And it really speeds up the process. Two words that companies love, less cost and fast. Efficiency and savings of cost. Supply chain management, the e-commerce was a very simplistic view of it. People love the blockchain for that. HPCL is already experimenting with the blockchain for the supply chain. And copyright and patent allocation is again one place where a lot of legal firms have come together to actually use the blockchain to store copyright and patent information. 
So all of this is great, but where does the capital domain come into all of this? So to explain to you how capital markets are now looking at blockchain, we are going to look at a very specific instance in the New York Stock Exchange that actually made New York Stock Exchange realize that they should move towards the blockchain for at least one part of their operations. This also happened in the last two years. This happened in the late 2020s. This happened with a company called GameStop. And what happened with them was something known as a short squeeze. So let's try to understand what happened and why blockchain. So before we jump down to short squeeze, let's first understand short selling. So needless to say, anyone who's opened the paper in the last two weeks knows what short selling is, right? Everyone has heard about Adani, everyone has heard about Hindenburg Group. So what is short selling? Let's first understand a very basic difference between investing and short selling. So for any organization which is listed in the stock market or any company with any share which is being traded in the stock market, prices keep fluctuating. So you have prices which go up and they go down. And classically how we think of it is, okay, let me buy low and sell high. So I buy something at 100 rupees, I sell it at 200 rupees, I made a profit of 100 bucks and I'm very happy. But the beauty of stock market is that is not the way the markets work. The markets also have a wonderful way of making money when you're going on the way down. And that is what is called short sell. So in short sell, what you do is you first sell your product when the price is high and then you buy it when the price is low. So what that means is I sold the product at 200 bucks and when the price fell, I bought it back at 100 and I made a profit of 100. So Hindenburg Group specializes in short sell. And that is why it was in the papers and it was synonymously used with short sell. So Hindenburg Group did their due intelligence, due diligence. They felt that there was something going on in the companies and they could make money by the shares price dropping. So they did whatever they did. I'm not going into what they did and why they did on the ethical part of it. But the interesting part is how do you sell something that you don't have, right? So how do I do short sell? How will I sell first and buy later? So there are multiple ways to achieve short selling. First is for very few people, they might already be owning that company. Maybe I own some shares of that company and I plan to keep it for the next 50 years, but I know that the price is going to fall. So what I might do is because I already own it and I plan to keep it for a very, very, very long time. I'll sell those shares and then buy it back when the price reduces. But there are very few people who will be fitting into this market category. So the next type of trading that happens is known as futures and options or derivatives trade. So futures and options is a very complex uh, trading methodology which works on leverage. Because it works on leverage and it's more of a promise that in the future I'm going to pay you or I'm going to buy from you or I'm going to sell you. Not everybody likes to do this. And therefore comes in a much more interesting model of trading, which is I temporarily borrow the shares from someone I know they own, sell it, buy it back and return those stocks back to them. So I didn't have anything. I borrowed it from my friend, sold it in the market, bought it back from the market, returned it to my friend. And because I took it for a short duration, I'll consider it as a loan and I'll give him some amount of money. So my friend is happy because he earned something additional. I am happy because without actually buying, because obviously I don't want to buy, I want to sell. I was able to achieve it and make profit on it. This is the, the short selling that actually New York Stock Exchange wants to target because of whatever happened with GameStop. So what happened with GameStop? Let's try and understand that. So GameStop, what happened with GameStop is a short squeeze. So what is that? Before we understand short squeeze, let's also understand what is GameStop? So GameStop is basically a brick and mortar store based in US which sells, you know, video games. Brick and mortar means basically it's a physical shop based store. It's not an Amazon which has a digital presence only. 2020s, pandemic, lockdown, people were not going out, loss of jobs, people were not buying things. So GameStop was having a very hard time as expected. So 
seeing that pandemic and uh, presented a lot of hard time from GameStop, GameStop shares were continuously falling down. And this provided a very interesting opportunity to few fund managers, primarily Citron Research and Melvin Capital, where they realized that, okay, prices of that stock is going to fall. So let me basically do what I a short sell because I'm going to make money later on anyways. And hey, given the pandemic, some or the other wave might strike and I'm going to make money for sure. So they started selling the shares. The problem that happened is they went overboard. They sold too many shares. They borrowed and sold and then borrowed again and sold and borrowed again and sold. Eventually what happened was at a point of time, there were 122% of the free float of your market being short sold. So what is free float? So basically, if I say that a company, a listed organization has 100 shares in the stock market, out of this 100 shares, a certain percentage, let's say 50 is owned and kept by the promoter. So 50, 50 shares have been released to the public. So you, I, institutional investors, FIS, everybody will be owning those 50 shares. That 50 is known as the free float, something which is not tied with the investors or the original promoters and is available for to be publicly traded on a regular basis. Normally you would also reduce from this 50 the long term institutional investors but for simplicity I am keeping it as 50. Now if I am continuously borrowing there could be a state where I have sold the share to someone and then borrowed it back somehow through that person again. So eventually what happened is 122% of this free float went into short sell. And some guys identified this. And the fun part of it is these guys were not some savvy hedge fund managers sitting in Wall Street. These guys were simple small scale retail investors. One guy identified it and published this information on Reddit. So in Reddit there is a subreddit called Wall Street Bets. So it's been in the news in the late 2020s thanks to GameStop. And they published it and they literally cartelized and they started buying GameStop shares because they wanted to basically punish these hedge fund members. So what? now the problem is they've bought a lot of shares. They are buying this free float available. Once they started buying shares, the price started increasing. The number of free shares available in the market started reducing. So the people who had borrowed and sold, they are now not able to Re return it to the people they've borrowed it from. Hence comes the problem. This resulted in something known as a short squeeze. So suddenly I need to return the shares to someone. He's asking me because I told him I'll return it to you in five days. But if I go to buy it from the market, I'm not able to buy it from the market. So what do I do? I'm getting panicked. So I suddenly start saying that, okay, fine. Earlier it was, I was going to buy it at hundred bucks. I'll pay you 200, please give it to me. I'll pay you 400, please give it to me. And this causes a huge spike in the price of the stock. It's a temporary intermittent price, a spike, but a spike nonetheless. And what was the impact of that spike? The price of the stock increased 30 times in a span of three weeks. So basically someone who would have bought that stock on 1st of November, theoretically, on 21st November, he was worth 30 times that. But short squeeze is intermittent. It's a spike. It's like a noise. Within two weeks, prices fell back to 30%. Right? But this intermittent spike does not come without casualties. So what was the impact? The first impact was massive losses by many funds, primarily two funds, Melvin Capital, Citron Research. Melvin Capital reported that they lost about $500 million and they later had to shut down their operations in by about uh, mid of 2021. Citron Research again published that they had lost again in, uh, in the ballpark of hundreds of millions of dollars. So. Win for the good guys? Not really. You know why? Because who's investing in these hedge funds? Whose money are these hedge fund managers playing with? Normal investors. 
right each one of you finally uh, what is a hedge fund manager it's just a glow it's a little advanced version of a mutual fund if i can say so right so you guys are investing in mutual fund similarly a lot of other people had put their pension their other savings with these hedge fund guys so who lost money it was you and i at the end of the day the retail investors who were actually participating in the short squeeze through wall street bet also lost money why because in this euphoria a lot of those members bought stocks when the price was really going high to on the road to the 30x and the higher they go the harder they fall so the prices the with the speed in which they went up with the same speed they also fell down and people lost overnight not overnight but in a span of a week to two weeks they lost 70% of net value so there was a lot of losses even to retail investors and seeing this losses and problems litigation started coming in so now your courts are getting backlogged there's more money what the losses that we are talking is immediate losses but there's a much bigger loss that is happening because of litigation class action suits and the like and lot of regulation so then they had uh, about 6 months of congressional hearings to understand what happened and how we can avoid it so given this challenge that new york stock exchange faced they have explored an option of blockchain they are exploring how they are going to use blockchain to avoid another short squeeze like phenomena like what happened with gamestop so very similar to the example that we saw earlier you have a blockchain based platform so basically it's a blockchain based platform which on which all different entities are going to get onboarded so you'll have lenders you'll have institutional investors or all these you know citron research melvin capital and other hedge funds and other institutions you'll have new york stock exchange and you'll have retail investors because all of them are on the blockchain the first advantage that we are going to get is we have a situation where we can everybody sees what the other guy is doing and it's all in real time so if a situation does arise that someone is over borrowing it can be flagged through different smart contracts and different elements institutional investors are also happy about it because a they will not become the next melvin capital and b because it's a blockchain the cost of borrowing from lenders will reduce because their lending and returning that entire stock borrow and stock return cost will be coded on the blockchain as a smart contract and that will help them save costs in the long run for the retail investors they get a better view and they don't have to cartelize on wall street bet based on guesses they can actually see real time data and take calls and for the new york stock exchange much more better visibility much more better control and this is how blockchain is now being conceptualized by new york stock exchange to actually avoid the gamestop short squeeze like situations and as a matter of fact new york stock exchange is not the only exchange in the world you have hong kong stock exchange which is using blockchain to actually do settlements for the north bound trades australia stock exchange has a blockchain based program to overhaul their entire post trade settlement life cycle you have uh, jp morgan chase experimenting on bonds and there are many other entities which are actually experimenting with blockchain for their different capital domain related operations to improve on the efficiency and to save costs and some and many a times to improve vigilance and to have much better control and regulation so that's all from my side um, i will leave the floor open for any questions in case anyone has Okay. In case you do not have any questions right now, you're too sleepy post lunch, waiting for your coffee break. I totally understand that. So you can definitely catch up with me also offline because I'll be there for the next couple of days here, anyways. Okay. So I'm then in that case, I'm not gonna take much of your time because we're already running over time. Okay.
Okay, I think we are anyways running out of time. So probably if anyone has any question, I can meet you outside or after the session. So I would like to thank SMIT and all the organizing members for this opportunity and look forward to much more interactions between the industry and other colleges. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir and ma'am, for the wonderful session. Now, may I request the convener, IECAP 2023, Dr. Biswaraj Singh, additional professor of the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, Sikkim Manipal Institute of Technology, to offer our token of appreciation to Mr. Aditya Kyal and Ms. Sangeeta Das, NRI FinTech. Sir. Dignitaries are requested to go to the adjacent room for high tea, and volunteers are requested to escort the dignitaries. I repeat, dignitaries are requested to go to the adjacent room for high tea, and volunteers are requested to escort the dignitaries. Thank you.